Esther chapter 5 verse 1 says the following. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor. Somebody say favor favor in his sight and the king held out to the Esther golden scepter that was in his hand and Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. I'm going to speak today about I believe probably one of the most important messages you will hear in church. It's about renewing of the mind. See we have a battle on three fronts. First battle happens in the realm of the spirit. In the realm of the spirit, meaning in invisible realm, we fight with prayer, fasting, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God. Then there's a second realm, it happens in our mind. The battle happens in our mind. You can win the battle in the spiritual realm, but if you don't win the battle in your mind, your, your life will still might not be changed. And then there's the battle that happens in our life, in our practical everyday life. And we're going to look at Esther, how she did it on all of these three realms. And when it comes to fighting in our spiritual realm, you know, we are a church that believes the spiritual world is real. But in the spiritual world, we have superiority because we are the children of Most High God. We're not beggars, orphans, we're not victims. We are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're boss, hashtag boss, blessed in Jesus' name. Come on somebody. But it's not just because we profess God's blessings, it's because we possess the lifestyle of prayer fasting and surrender to Jesus. And so as a local church, we practice fasting and prayer not to get fit or lose weight even though these are the benefits but we are doing it because there's a spiritual war that we want to see the victory Jesus has won on the cross to be manifested in our life. So starting tonight at 12 all the way till Wednesday evening we are going into three days of fasting and I challenge each one of you fast with us. For those of you who've ever been a Christian and you've never fasted, you know, the Bible says that Jesus says when you fast, not if you fast. Meaning Jesus expected Christians to fast. It's sadly that today fasting is radical when in the Bible it was regular. It's crazy how today when people fast you're like, oh it's a revival. That's normal. That's like basic kindergarten Christianity. That's not like some Navy SEAL special ops, you know, kind of a Christianity. This is basic, normal, everyday Christianity. And so we want to challenge you that tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday, take time to fast with us. If you can't fast all three days without eating, you know, from sun up to sundown. If you maybe have an illness and you can't fast particular foods, fast something but fast. The Lord reminded me uh, last, uh, last time that we were doing fasting as a church, how important it is not to fast for the sake of fasting. Sometimes you hear people, uh, us saying, hey church, let's fast. You're like, okay, I have to fast. Why? Vlad says I have to fast. Yes, I'm fasting. Don't fast for the sake of fasting. Have a purpose to your fast. In your fast, believe that God will shift the spiritual atmosphere in your life. That God will bring a breakthrough in the spiritual realm for your family, for your calling, for your purpose and for our region. We're not just fasting just because Jesus said to fast. Esther's fasting is shifted the spiritual realm in her continent, in her region and in her city. And our fasting will do exactly the same. We all know that fasting is a sacrifice. In Romans chapter 12 verse 1 it says that I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice. If Paul would be preaching today, if we will have a guest, Apostle Paul, he would get up and he said, I beseech you people living in Washington State, Tri-Cities, to present your body as a living sacrifice. You would say, Paul, how do I do that? Because in the Old Testament, you killed the animal, then you offered it as a sacrifice. In the New Testament, God says, I don't want you dead. I have a lot of dead people already. <laughs> I want you alive and present your body as a sacrifice. How can you present your body as a sacrifice? You may say, well, I don't smoke. That's as a sacrifice. That's obedience. You shouldn't smoke because if God will want you to smoke, he'll put a chimney in the top of your head and he didn't. That's not God's will for you. You may say, well, I don't drink. That is my sacrifice. Uh, not being involved in drunkenness is not a sacrifice. It's part of our obedience as Christians. You may say, well, I don't smoke weed. You may say, well, I don't steal with my hands. That is your obedience. The only thing I could see you can do with your body that's a sacrifice is fasting. 
everything else is obedience with our body when you're not involved in sexual immorality and you're not using your body that's part of your obedience as a Christian the only thing you can do to present your body as a sacrifice is fasting so Paul says present your body this next three days as a living sacrifice in Jesus name holy and acceptable and pleasing unto your God and so what we're gonna do next three days is instead of doing 24-hour prayer we are going to have a prayer here from six to seven somebody says six to seven now we're not gonna stop you at seven you can still continue and uh, Monday Tuesday and Wednesday so we would like each one of you if you've never done it and you're not working during the time set your alarm to like four o'clock then set it at 4 30 5 5 30 and then 5 45 <laughs> and uh, grab a coffee two maybe and then come over here you can come in your pajamas you can come but just, just come clothed and we're gonna pray we're gonna see God's face and we're gonna see a shift in the spiritual realm we're gonna see a shift in our region and in our city and in your family in Jesus name if you want to see physical blessings you got to fight them in the spirit can somebody say amen those of you who are excited for that let's put our hands together for Jesus Christ but I want you I want you to see this that Esther fasted shift happened but she didn't see that shift until she dressed up in royal garments and went to see the king. Fasting creates a shift. Renewing of the mind lets you see it. How many of you know that a lot of things happen and we don't see it? A lot of people what they do is when they pray, when they fast, when they repent, when they renounce and they say I don't see changes in my life. In the area of spiritual warfare, I usually see two categories of people on a regular basis. The first category of people is people who are shocked that their problems have spiritual roots. They come out and they say, oh my goodness, a light just went out in my mind. That the problem that I'm facing is actually generational. It has spiritual roots and now I'm going to fight against spiritual forces. 50% of people. The second 50% of people, and it's like a broken clock all the time. I know it's a spiritual problem. I have prayed, I have fasted and then they begin to name places they've been to for help and I pretty much know most of those places so they say I went to that place, I went to that church, I went to that prayer, I went to this, I went to that. I've lied. I have repented, I have renounced it, I have been resisting the devil, I have been naming it, claiming it, standing on a promise and this is what they say. It's not working. I'm still the same. I'm still sick, I still have nightmares and they begin to you know the mouth betrays your mind. And so they begin to with their mouth begin to actually give an x-ray of what's happening in their mind right away and they say well it's not working I am disappointed I am discouraged this this is not working and by the time and I usually listen by the time they finish and I see a missing ingredients in spiritual warfare where people fight and after the fight because they don't see change in the physical realm they dress down in the rags of their problem instead of dressing up in the royal garments of their position in Jesus Christ so let's break this down point number one after warfare don't dress down in rags somebody say amen touch your neighbor say don't dress down the bible says in romans chapter 12 remember the verse one we says it says that present your body as a living sacrifice and then apostle paul says this do not conform to the world Meaning after I give my body as a living sacrifice, I fast, shift happens in the spiritual realm and Paul says don't, just because you don't see the change in the natural, your body doesn't change yet, your family doesn't change yet, your finances don't change yet, you don't change yet, you don't see the change and Paul says before you see the change, make a decision, do not conform to this world meaning don't dress down to the level of the problem that still persists after spiritual warfare come on somebody hallelujah your problem always will give you a dress code every conference i go to they give me a t-shirt it's it's, an, it's a new thing now in christianity that every event has a t-shirt I have t-shirts so many so anytime I go in I already expect a t-shirt and so when they give me a t-shirt I never reject the t-shirt because it's not nice to reject the t-shirt they, they mean it really well and so when they give me a t-shirt I usually touch it and I say thank you and while I'm touching it I'm already 
testing the spirit <laughs> I'm testing the fabric and so as I'm thinking I'm already deciding will I ever wear this or not half of the things I get I never wear I give them to you guys I'm just kidding I give them to interns <laughs> there's a revelation there hang in there and so as I touch the fabric I already make a decision I said thank you thank you I, I know it means a lot to you uh, but graphic sucks fabric sucks I'm never wearing this in my life but thank you because it's not nice to reject what they give you every place I go to gives me something to wear but it's my decision to put it on even when you came to our church today we give you something to wear too and some of you you're like um you got the t-shirts like thank you and you're touching it and some of you will say mm -mm, but you're not going to give it back right because it's not going to be nice when you go through sickness the sickness will give you a t-shirt when you go through financial challenge the fi finances will give you rags every situation you go through will give you something to wear you have to look at your situation and say thank you I'm not wearing that because you got it you don't have to wear it come on somebody just because you got it you don't have to wear it you can put it in the wardrobe of forgetfulness and not put it on you see the problem is many of you you put on everything everyone gives you your abuse gave you a mindset and you put it on your past gave you a mindset and you're putting it on and today God wants you not dress down in the rags of your situation don't dress it down touch your neighbor say don't wear everything you get touch your other neighbors so don't think on the level of your problem why is that important because whatever you wear you represent why are we giving t-shirts for free because we want you to represent us why do youth groups give me t-shirts because they want me to represent them why does your past give you a mindset because your past wants you to always stay alive in your present but you're representing it by the thoughts you carry from your past don't represent your past don't represent cancer don't represent abuse don't represent your addiction because my bible makes me to understand you're an ambassador of christ i mean you represent christ you don't represent your sin you don't represent your pain you don't represent your sickness you don't represent your bankruptcy you don't represent your divorce you don't represent what people have done to you you represent jesus christ and esther i love this about esther is she's fought the spiritual warfare but she doesn't dress up in rags mordecai did Mordecai dressed up in rags because he felt discouraged. Esther says, you know what? I am a queen. I know I am in trouble. Hell is breaking loose, but I will not wear what I got. I will wear who I am. I want to challenge some of you who come with rags today to church, who wear rags and your explanation for the way you think the way you behave, the way your attitude is, well you don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand, no, 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 no. You don't understand one thing that just because that thing that you've been through gave you a t-shirt, it was still your choice to put it on you. The Bible says put off the old man and put on Jesus Christ. Represent the kingdom. Represent where you go and you may say, well Vlad, this problem I'm fighting is not changing. Did you know that when you die, that problem will die? Which means that problem is not eternal you will live forever the problem will die at your funeral that tells you this problem is what worth representing it's not eternal in its substance you are a child of God put on Jesus put on peace put on hope when you're fighting spiritual forces you must understand the second facet is your mind not just your life number two I want you to write down that dress up in royal robes even when the problem lingers not only we don't we don't dress up we don't dress down in the rags we dress up in royal robes even when the problem lingers not when the problem is solved not when you get the doctor's report and you find out you don't have illness no more like oh praise God I am healed not then that's good that's normal but it doesn't take any faith to rejoice when you have a test when you have a testimony it takes faith to rejoice before you get the testimony 
and God wants you to do what Esther did. God wants me to do what Esther did. Esther dressed up in the royal garments when the problem was still intact. When you do spiritual warfare, when you fight against the forces of darkness, when you break generational curses, when you renounce the demonic things that are maybe being attached to your life, that has to lead not just, oh I'm gonna check right now the problem, does it still linger? No, 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 no. You don't wait to see if the problem lingered before you renew your mind. You renew your mind and then you see the problem change. Romans chapter 12 verse 1 it says present your body as a living sacrifice. That's spiritual warfare. Do not conform to the world. That means don't dress down to your situation. But it says renew your mind and then you'll be transformed. Renewing your mind what that means is this is you change default subconscious automatic responses of your thoughts they did studies on a lot of animals and i'll present to you one you probably have heard this about elephants how an elephant can be pulled by a small tiny rope and when they would ask the trainer who trains elephants and they say how can you carry this heavy i mean many tons animal who can just pull slightly and pull you and the rope and half of the circus that you put him into how are you able to restrain him like that and the trainers would usually tell you that the same rope we used on this elephant when the elephant was a baby and the elephant baby elephant couldn't pull this rope because the, the rope was strong and the elephant was weak and at that time when he was an infant when he was just a little baby we used it to pull him and he tried to resist the more he resisted the, the, the stronger the, it felt like the stronger the robe got and, and then the elephant developed this in his subconscious that the robe is strong I am weak I can't beat it the elephant grew but that never changed in his mind so they're not using a higher better more advanced robe they're using the same robe from his childhood because it gives him a connection I tried and I failed even though the elephant has grown and the rope didn't. See what you must understand my friends is that strongholds operate like this. Write this down. Anything that's prolonged develops a stronghold. Anything that's prolonged in your life, if it's diabetes, if it's marital discourse, if it's shortage of finances, if it's people dying at an early age in your family tree, if it's your addiction to nicotine or your constant temptation with pornography that you fall into anything that's been prolonged very soon becomes a stronghold a stronghold behind every stronghold is a lie and behind every lie is fear behind every fear is an idol meaning it's a place we don't trust God in his sufficiency to meet our deepest needs at the expense of Christ's death. Stronghold is something that's developed because we've been fighting something for so long and we didn't achieve victory. We can develop into a stronghold. At the root of it, behind it is a lie. Behind every lie is fear. And behind every fear is an idol. Something we don't trust Jesus in that area. How do we overcome that stronghold? I'm going to give you just four practical tips. Number one, fill your soul with the abundance of God's love. Remind yourself, God loves you. Say this with me, so much. Not just loves you, but somebody say so much. And I'll give you a scripture. John chapter 3 verse 16, it says, for God so loved. It didn't say for God so loved his children. He says the world, meaning the messed up people like us so much so if God loved us so much when we were messed up can you imagine how much he loves us now that we're a little bit less messed up so much more if God loved me so much in order to you may say what does this have to do with my mind because the Bible says perfect love casts out fear in order to destroy a stronghold you have to knock out fear to knock out fear you have to remind yourself God loves me I'm not perfect he loves me I'm not good enough he loves me God's love washes away the foundations of fear it lets me know he won't fail me he doesn't have a hidden agenda against me he loves me God doesn't have mood swings God doesn't doesn't wake up with the wrong foot every single day God doesn't need coffee to have a good attitude toward you the Bible says he is good all 
all the time when it rains when it snows when you're on your period or when you got promotion it's all the time somebody say all the time God loves me all the time and that gives me a chance to crack fear break fear secondly I want you to see this is fill your mind with truth you have to fill your mind consciously with truth why because whatever you fill your mind with very soon becomes your mindset your mindset is something you can't change your mindset is the default automatic subconscious thing that thinks you know it's the thing that when you're quiet it thinks that controls you you can control this that controls this so in order to change that your subconscious your mindset in order to change your mindset you don't go trying to change your mindset that's impossible you go changing what you fill your mind with because what's going goes here once it fills it slips into subconscious into your mindset and becomes your mindset the biggest mistake people make is they go in trying to change their mindset you have to change what you fill your mind with because what you filled your mind with becomes your mindset mindset is a result of a long time a mind being filled with certain things so change what you listen to change what you watch and change what you what you constantly observe change who you hang out with why so that your mind can be filled with things you want your mindset to look like in five years can somebody say amen number three resist thoughts of fear assist thoughts of faith resist thoughts of fear assist thoughts of faith why because thoughts of fear are like weeds in your yard they don't need to be nurtured they grow on their own thoughts of faith are like a flower they don't be they don't grow on their own they need to be nurtured they need to be assisted anything I want you to write this down is the faith thoughts are not going to stay they need to be assisted fear thoughts are not going to leave they need to be resisted anything good that comes to your heart is not gonna stay and you probably already know that it's like it runs from you why because it needs to be nurtured it needs to be held it needs to be paid attention to repeated consciously rehearsed held uh, watered if you want to feel that lo that loneliness it will stay there on its own it won't leave it's not going to leave because you're hor you're you're feeling horrible it needs to leave because you're going to kick it out negative thoughts are like bad boyfriend you gotta dump him <laughs> he's not gonna leave okay he's not gonna grow like grow brains and I just leave you know you just gotta dump that guy and then if he keeps chasing you restraining order and good thoughts faith thoughts is like a good friend he's always busy or like the person that you really like and you hope that they like you back you know like they seem not to notice you you gotta kind of you gotta kind of put some put some thought into it put some nurture into it it's just not gonna happen and so the biggest change of mind you must understand is the positive things are not going to stay negative things are not going to leave that's why i got to push back the negative and pull in the positive it's not automatic otherwise everybody will be positive everybody will have all the christians who carry their name as a believer would be actually believers how many believers are fearers and, and doubters and why because it doesn't happen automatically and lastly align your inner talk with God's truth what is the inner talk it's the thing that you say within you that nobody else hears but you it's your inner voice a woman with an issue of blood went to all the doctors wasted all of her money yet when she heard that Jesus is healing people the Bible says that she said listen to this she said to herself she didn't say oh I'm gonna get disappointed again Oh, I just hope that he touches me because if not it's going to be another disappointment she said to herself if I touch him I will be healed guess what happened she was unclean they could have kicked her out but see your inner talk dictates your direction you will always go in the direction of your inner voice a prodigal son was with pigs and the bible says he said to himself I will get up I will go to my father he didn't say it out loud he didn't post it on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram he said within himself I will get up and I will go to my father and that's where his feet actually went where your inner voice goes your feet will follow come on somebody amen and lastly we're going to share it. that touch the scepter even if you don't get the solution I want you to see that Esther is fighting the spiritual warfare in prayer and fasting 
and Romans 12 1 it says that to present our body as a living sacrifice then Esther she refuses to dress down in the same garments that Mordecai is wearing outside on the street and Romans chapter 12 verse 2 it says that don't conform to this world meaning don't dress down on the level of your feelings on the level of your circumstances Esther instead she puts on royal garments and they symbolize her identity as a queen she's feeling like hell she's going through hell her world is falling apart but she's not dressing up as what she's going through she's dressing up as she, who she is and the Bible says to renew your mind and it gives us this promise that you will be transformed through the renewing of the mind. I want to take a hit on this myth that I believe will give some of you great encouragement. Renewing of the mind does not bring a miracle. It brings momentum. Transformation is not magic. Caterpillar doesn't become a butterfly in four seconds. It's, it's magical but it's not supernatural in a sense that it doesn't happen instantly. It's a momentum by which it develops into a butterfly. She comes to a king dressed up all pretty. Looks so beautiful. The king is not aware of her situation. And the Bible doesn't say that Esther, I want you to see what she does not do at the court. She doesn't come to the court and she doesn't create a panic. You know, ladies, you, you have a gift to create drama. <laughs> Many of you don't use that gift. But some of you, that gift, that's the only gift that's operating full functional. Instead of being a queen of Jesus, you're a drama queen. <laughs> and I am not in any way objecting to, to you. I'm not judging. No judgment zone. <laughs> if there was one person who should have created a drama in the palace, it would be Esther. If I would have been Esther and I would have had a half of me being effeminate, I would come into that court <laughs> And I would say, you, 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 what are you guys thinking? Killing Jews, what's wrong with you? And you king, what are you sitting over there? Do something. I mean, I would create a little, I would put an emotion to it. Esther comes in dressed up all pretty and the Bible doesn't say, she doesn't ask, she doesn't panic, she doesn't even pray, she doesn't beg, she doesn't cry. She stands there all pretty until the king is looking and looking and looking and looking and the king stretches a scepter which was another word for actually letting her live because she came uninvited and in the culture of the court, court said if you come uninvited unless the king stretches a scepter you're dead. So he stretches a scepter and this would have been a great moment to I don't need your scepter. I need help. My people are dying. What is, what is that? You're giving me a stick? Give me a solution, not a scepter. But the Bible says Esther touches the scepter. The problem didn't change. But changed the wind in her life. Momentum came in her favor now. Everything changed. Nothing changed. You know what changed? The king gave her favor. Transformation has started. A caterpillar. A process has kicked in of the caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Oh did it happen in one second? And we know in the story it did not happen. And Esther is calm. I think on the inside it's like raging everything. Like, but on the outside Esther is touching the scepter and the king says, Oh queen give me your request up to the half of my kingdom. If I would have been that I was a king I just want to live. Kill Haman. That's all. That's all I want our conversation is over she says come to my banquet why are you asking him for the banquet if you're gonna die probably by tomorrow see Esther knows this when God gives you momentum ride the wave when God shifts a wind and the wind blows in your back run run with it she comes to the banquet and the king asks her again, what do you want? This would be a great moment to say, I kind of been wanting to tell you that uh, we're dying. We need your help. And she says, I want you to come again. I want you to see. She milks the moment. She really takes advantage of this momentum that is happening right now. And this is what happens. That night, the momentum picks up and the enemy loses it. 
because king has a sleepless night and next morning when the enemy thinks Haman thinks I'm going to hang Mordecai and the king says I want you to parade Mordecai around the city the, the, the enemy loses the momentum he comes home angry mad because his plans are not working out he's running he's running late to the another banquet and you see the friction is happening with the enemy why because when you are riding the momentum that God gives you the enemy loses it you're noticing that your sickness now is not the same as it used to be. It's declining. Your marital discourse is not the same as it used to be. Your kid actually called you back. Yeah, I know you have 15 collections, but you paid one off. Everything in your life is not working, but one thing started to work and you ride the way because momentum leads to enemy losing momentum. I want to help somebody in this room today and to tell you that sometimes God will not answer your prayer by giving you a miracle. He will give you momentum. He will stretch a scepter. Touch the scepter. Take the small blessing He gives you and milk it. Meaning ride it. Work with it. And it will turn to something greater and something better. The pastor who dropped us off in Pittsburgh, his name was Vitaly. When he and his wife got a child for 10 months, the child was completely not responsive couldn't hold, hold her head, couldn't lift her arms and, and legs, completely non-responsive. And this pastor told us that it was such a crushing feeling when they did operations on the child and they said we are really sorry and he gave me the name of that disease that the child had is your child will be on the wheelchair for the rest of her life and she's not going to be able to walk she's not going to be able to lift her hand move her head and nothing we're sorry but there's nothing we can do there's some kind of a big big problem in her in her system for 10 months she was in the hospital and he decided to take the baby out of the hospital she, he realized the doctors cannot do anything and he you know his wife was really distraught it's very heartbreaking when you when you see your child it's lifeless body for 10 months and he says i started to pray and i made a decision in the room i held this baby and i said i looked at his daughter and i said to my daughter i said whether you're gonna walk or not i'm gonna be the best father this world has ever seen he said i will love you he says and i believe god will do a miracle there was a movie playing at the same time and in the movie there was a scene while he's doing this a movie there's a scene where the father is walking with the daughter to give her in marriage and as he's looking at that he says I heard God speak to me and he said I want you to look at this image right now freeze the frame he says plant that into your mind because that's exactly what's going to happen to your daughter he said you're not going to pull her wheelchair you will walk with her down the aisle and you will give her in marriage he said I felt God came into the room and he says, I held that baby and I started to imagine in my mind, he says that she, I will walk her down the aisle. He says, I started to pray for her wedding, though she was lifeless. He said, in about four months, the baby improved so much, the baby started to move. Today, the daughter is walking and within, I think, a year, he's going to be walking her down the aisle as God promised to her when she was incurable. What happened? Was it just an instant miracle? It was God dressing him up in faith and him saying, God, I trust you. And the momentum started in his favor. See, we always expect a miracle, but we will embrace momentum also. Somebody say amen. I watched a testimony this week of a, of a girl who, a lady who lost her nephew and her nephew was lost and she thought it was kidnapped. So she went to the witch doctors. It didn't happen in this country. And the witch doctors told her that your, your boy has already been offered as a sacrifice for a ritual, satanic ritual. And she was so distraught. She came to church where the pastor, God uses him in the gift of prophecy. And so he comes up to her and she tells him the whole case that I have a nephew, he's missing. And as the church started to pray, he looked at her and he said, he said, number one, your baby is not dead. He's still alive. And he begins to name both of his late parents who already died. He mentions why, why they died. And the crazy part is he begins to describe the exact house and the person who kidnapped them. Who was the father's sister. Her name was Julia or Juliet. And he begins to mention, and so the lady, kind of, her eyes come out, I was like, oh, I know that lady. And so he says that the boy is in that house and, and that's it. So her world kind of changed. For me, the crazier part was when he says, let's call Juliet right now. And she says, I don't have her number. I've never actually, I heard about her. I've never seen her. He says, well, if God could reveal to me who took the boy, did you think he can reveal to me her number? 
and right there on the live stream they start dialing her number and Julia picks up the phone says my name is Julia who is this and so right there on the live stream and God this is what happened is that God didn't bring the baby boy right away what he did is he changed the wind well now the lady left the service with the wind hitting her back instead of her face sometimes when you renew your mind what God will do is he will shift in the spiritual atmosphere and you will feel like things like a domino effect begins to happen in your life don't get discouraged just because not everything God worked out in your body but if you've seen one victory let it hit another one let it hit another one from glory to glory from faith to faith can somebody say amen I believe there are miracles that are going to be released today. I believe God is going to shift the wind in this room today. I believe as it says in Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For He has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to open the prison doors. And then there is this word it says there, to declare the year of God's favor to those who mourn in Zion. If you've been mourning, if you've been hurting, if you've been suffering, I am here today to declare along with the Holy Spirit, God is shifting season. God is shifting your season. God is shifting the wind. Get your sails ready. Get your, what's the board that you go on the waves? Surfboard ready. Get your business plan ready. Get ready to ask that girl out. Get ready to get married. Get ready for your business to shift. Get ready for the addiction that you're struggling to no longer have a grip on your life. Get ready for the atmosphere in your house to shift, dramatically change. Get ready for the outburst of anger that you could not control for the Holy Spirit to take over and your wife and your children say something is different about you. No, you didn't magically completely change yet but you're experiencing metamorphosis. You're no longer a caterpillar. You're not a butterfly yet but you are in the process you're being transformed. Touch his scepter even when He doesn't give you solution. If God doesn't give you everything that you want right now, but He gives you a scepter, He gives you favor, touch that favor. Say, God, if you give me mercy, I'm going to grab mercy and I'm going to work with that. I'm going to ride that in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching this content. I hope this was a blessing to you. If you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.